Hey guys, today we're going to be looking at an important cultural trend that was big in the first half of the 20th century, and that is known as the crisis of modernity. Here are your goals. All right, so what do we mean by the crisis of modernity? Well, basically, the crisis of modernity can be understood as a shift in European attitudes that happened in the early 20th century. So before the 20th century, before the year 1900, most Europeans were fairly confident that European rationality, science, and technology would lead to ongoing progress. Life was going to get better and better thanks to logic and science and just general European awesomeness. After 1900, though, many upper and middle class individuals began to feel anxious that there was something deeply wrong with European civilization. And this was kind of a general, not very well-defined feeling at first, uh, but it was characterized by a number of different uh, characteristics. There were uh, widespread doubts about the value of Western culture. There were lots of unsettling new ideas in the sciences and humanities that changed the way people thought about themselves. And this general crisis was made worse by the uh, terrible, terrible uh, event that was World War One, that was terrible and violent and that made very little sense while it was going on or afterwards looking back on it. And so as a result of this crisis of modernity, newer, darker ways of understanding humanity and society emerge. Uh, people, a lot of people begin to believe that progress does not really exist, that societies don't really get better over time. People begin to think that reason and science don't actually lead to progress or to understanding of the world. And people also begin to believe that human beings, instead of being good as the Enlightenment taught, were actually violent and irrational creatures. By looking at the doubts that uh, Europeans began to hold about Western culture. So these doubts began creeping into European consciousness right around the time that Europe was reaching the height of world power and material wealth. Um, and so uh, leading figures, especially like professors and writers and painters, began to reject a lot of Western norms. These were norms that had been popular since the Enlightenment, like rationality and progress and um, industrialization. Uh, one of the main things that they attack is modern industrial life. Thinkers begin to criticize the busy, ugly, ruthless aspects of industrial living. And they begin to dream of returning to a quiet, joyful sort of country life where things move slowly and you have time for human relationships and the simple pleasures of life. Um, this, this sort of dream was reflected in lots of paintings. And the painting I have here, The Joy of Life by Henri Matisse, definitely reflects these sort of uh, anti-industrial uh, urges that people were beginning to feel around the turn of the century. Uh, another thing was the impact of imperialism. So as uh, Europe began to control more and more of the world and to come into more direct contact with people in Africa and Asia, uh, they began to doubt the superiority of Western culture or Western ideas. They see all these problems coming out of industrial life and they start to think that maybe the, uh, these other ways of life that earlier generations had seen as primitive may actually be better than the way the Europeans were doing it. Sure, the Europeans had better weapons and more stuff, but these African and Asian societies seemed to be happier and wiser than the Europeans were. And so they begin to doubt these ideas and also begin to bring these ideas in to European thought and uh, Asian and African traditions start to influence European art and European thought. And there's also widespread fear of this thing known as uh, decadence. And decadence was 
basically uh, something that could happen to a society. It was a state of weakness and decline brought about by a life of luxury and ease. Uh, Europeans were basically worried that because they had become so rich and advanced that they were sort of in a spiritual decline. And a lot of Europeans started to worry that Europe was kind of like a new Roman Empire and that they were be beginning to fall into decline even as they were reaching the height of their worldly power. Some of these general doubts about European culture, uh, there were a number of new and unsettling ideas coming from the physical sciences that made a lot of people question the old ideas that they held about the world. Namely, these new scientific ideas seemed to make the world a lot more irrational and weird than the old type of science that they got from the scientific revolution. And most of these big ideas were directly uh, contradictory to the ideas that Newton had put, put forward uh, a couple hundred years earlier. So Newton had argued that time and space were constant and uniform, and that the universe was rational and predictable. Basically, if uh, you had enough time, you could sit down and calculate exactly what would happen for the rest of time, uh, you know, if you, knew, if you knew all the variables, that the universe was predictable and rational. The new ideas totally go against this idea, and they make the world seem kind of chaotic and irrational. Uh, the first of these was Einstein's theory of relativity, which came around in the early 1900s. And Einstein proved mathematically that space and time change depending on the perspective of the observer. And so this is really weird. Basically, it throws out the main constant of Newton's, uh, Newton's world, the constant space and constant time, and replaces it with a world in which space and time change from person to person. So these things that were seen as uh, fundamental to our understanding are now no longer uh, constant and no longer really make that much sense to normal people. On top of this, quantum mechanics is another theory that comes around right around the same time. And Einstein's theory of relativity is really good for explaining how really, really big stuff works, like galaxies and black holes. Quantum mechanics is really good at explaining how really tiny stuff works, like protons and atoms and uh, photons and stuff like that. Uh, but it's upsetting because in order to explain the behavior of this really, really tiny stuff, uh, you have to accept that some of it is unknowable. Uh, basically, scientists recognize that it's impossible to predict exactly how uh, these tiny particles are going to change. And uh, so the only way to understand them is by using probability. And what this means is that uh, in order to work with these tiny things at all, you have to accept that there are some things about them that we will never know. And this makes a lot of people worry that the universe at its deepest level might either be totally random, that uh, these things behave unpredictably, or that they're just so difficult to understand that they are beyond human knowledge, that we will never be able to understand them really. So both Einstein and quantum mechanics uh, take away this sort of comforting view that Newton had about a sort of predictable world and, ch and exchange it for a very weird world in which space and time change depending on your perspective and in which the tiniest bits of reality behave in unpredictable ways. And on top of this, nobody has figured out exactly how to fit Einstein's theory of relativity together with quantum mechanics. They don't fit together. So, uh, we have these two theories that explain a lot of stuff, but they don't fit, which makes us think that there's something wrong about one of them or both of them. Uh, and people still haven't really figured out how to do this today. So uh, people are pretty sure that there's something wrong with, with our deepest kinds of science. So uh, these breakthroughs, even though they're complicated and uh, confusing, lead to important technological breakthroughs. Stuff like x-rays, nuclear power, and radio depend on these scientific breakthroughs. But at the same time that technology is advancing, it leads to a sort of psychological breakdown. Because most people are unable to make sense of these new theories, and therefore they're left with the sense that they don't actually understand the world at all.
Even Einstein was upset with the idea of quantum mechanics and that uh, the uh, tiny little particles are unpredictable. And Einstein never accepted it, insisting that God doesn't play dice with the universe, or basically that uh, there has to be a way to understand this deepest level of reality. But Einstein was never able to figure it out. On top of these unsettling ideas in the sciences, there are a number of unsettling ideas that crop up in the humanities as well. And the basic idea of all of these new ideas that catch on are that man is not rational in the way that the Enlightenment thinkers thought, but rather that he is irrational. And the three main figures that uh, express this view are Sigmund Freud, Max Weber, and Friedrich Nietzsche. So Sigmund Freud was a psychologist and he argued that human beings are controlled by irrational unconscious urges. Uh, basically, he said that the conscious mind, so you know, your, your conscious experience right now is not under your control, but rather that it is a battleground in which various instincts and desires play out. And even though you feel like you're making a choice, what you really do in your day-to-day -day life is determined by instincts and desires that you don't know about. And the only way for us to really know ourselves, he said, was by interpreting our dreams. Because in our dreams, the irrational desires and the deepest truths about ourselves are, um, are, are displayed before us. So we could learn about the irrational desires that are controlling us by interpreting our dreams. Uh, so on top, of, on top of Sigmund Freud, we had the ideas of Max Weber. And so Max Weber was a historian and sociologist who argued that uh, societies did not really progress along rational lines, but that they changed and developed over time because of the pl uh, different plays of irrational forces. So the force of tradition and the force of charisma were the two things that Max Weber said explained the development of most societies. Charisma being a sort of... Uh, irrational force that certain leaders are able to exude to get people to follow their ideas. Whether these are good ideas or bad ideas does not affect whether the charismatic individual will be able to lead people to follow him. What matters is instead his charismatic or her charismatic abilities. Weber also argued that society was not some kind of agreement like um, Locke or Rousseau argued. There was no social contract, but really that the foundation of all governments was the threat of violence. And so those who were able to control violence were able to control society. And finally, there's Friedrich Nietzsche, who was a philosopher, and he argued that the Enlightenment ideas of absolute truth and object objective rationality were myths, and that they needed to be abandoned if humans ever really wanted to understand themselves. All three of these guys caught on and became very popular in the early 20th century, and their ideas helped to shape the way people thought about themselves during that time period. So on top of all this, these mind-bending new ideas and this, this general anxiety about the uh, emptiness of European culture came World War I. It was an incredible shock uh, and it left 16 million people dead for apparently no good reason, but because uh, because a Serbian a Serbian terrorist killed an Austrian prince, 16 million people had to die. That does not make any sense in the minds of your average European, or really in my mind. And so what this seems to do is to confirm all of the doubts and all of the worries that people had been feeling in the early years of the 20th century. It seemed to prove that science and technology did not really lead to progress, that rather they just led to greater destructive potential for human beings. So they led, they gave us more tools with which we could work evil. It seemed to confirm that European civilization was not really better or more humane than other societies, but rather just less honest about its flaws. It pretended to be rational, whereas in fact it was just as barbaric as any other society on the planet. And it seemed to prove that individuals and nations were capable of carrying out terrible acts of violence for no reason or for really bad reasons, thereby showing that we were, deep down, very irrational. And this shock of war leads a lot of people.
people to reject the old ways of doing things, to reject the old Enlightenment ideas, and to look for new solutions to problems. And so last of all, guys, I want to talk about and think about how this connects up with broader culture. So a lot of these ideas, a lot of these artists were mainly, um, you know, not very many people got into this stuff. But these ideas eventually filter down to the point where they affect lots and lots of people, your average person. And the two main ways that they affect your average person are through advertising and through politics. Um, so the uh, originally, uh, going all the way back to Adam Smith and the Enlightenment, economists and businessmen assumed that the people who bought stuff, consumers, were rational and made purchases based on a cost-benefit analysis. So you try to buy the best product for the least amount of money. But after these new ideas about human irrationality come up, advertisers latch onto the idea of the irrational consumer. Uh, basically, that the consumer buys for instinctual reasons that he doesn't even understand, rather than uh, buying rationally. And so advertisers begin using emotionally or sexually charged images rather than rational argument to sell their product. So they, for example, they start putting pictures of pretty girls on advertisements for cigarettes, even though the two have nothing to do with each other. But people in their minds begin to associate pretty girls with a certain brand of cigarettes, and the, the sales go up. Additionally, uh, politics became increasingly irrational after World War I, as leaders in many countries began to appeal to the masses and re began rejecting traditional political theory. Instead of arguing uh, along the lines of socialism or liberalism, they basically just uh, appeal to the instincts and the emotions of the masses. And this works in a lot of places. They glorify action, they glorify the nation, they glorify violence, rather than making any sort of coherent argument about how to make the world better. And they are elected in a number of important uh, nations. Pictured here is Benito Mussolini, who um, sort of pioneered this approach and came up with the idea of fascism. So, uh, that's your video for today. I'm sorry it's pretty long, but these are uh, somewhat complex ideas. I will uh, look forward to talking about all this stuff with you guys tomorrow. Have a good night.